Hey guys, how's it going? I was gonna film this video outside, but uh, I, I, live in a, I live in a suburban neighborhood and somebody decided to start like sawing wood or just doing something very loud. So here we are back at my desk and today we're actually gonna go through a complete guide to seed starting 101. I love seed starting personally and if you haven't been here, my name is Brooke, this is the Seed to Play channel, and this is where we talk about all things urban and suburban gardening, as well as some cooking as well. So I think that people feel like they're very limited when they're in an urban or suburban space in regards to gardening, but that is just not true. You have to get a little creative sometimes, but it's totally achievable. So um, this video was actually inspired by one of my dear friends who is um, a more of a beginner gardener, and she was so excited to start seeds and I ended up having to tell her that they were not going to be viable. So um, I started thinking about how, you know, we're taught in school, you know, I think everybody's done the whole like lima bean and the paper Dixie cup thing. <laughs> um, that works sometimes, but um, really seed starting, it can be complicated, it also can be very easy. So. We are going to talk about all the things you need to get started with seed starting, why you should seed start if you want to, um, uh, how you're gonna do it, when you're gonna do it. We're gonna cover everything. So it's probably gonna be a long video. Just buckle in, grab yourself a little notepad or maybe a cup of coffee or something um, because this is going to be back to the basics seed starting edition. I want to talk about is why you should or you may want to start seeds um, as opposed to buying transplants from the store. So a few reasons on why you would want to start seeds. First, and this is probably the biggest thing for me personally, is the variety that you can get when you start seeds versus when you buy transplants at the store. When you buy transplants, you're very limited in regards to what kinds of varieties or how many varieties that you can even plant, right? There might be five to 10 different types of tomatoes, there might be like five to 10 different types of peppers, maybe like one kind of eggplant. Um, just to give you an idea, I am actually growing 22 different varieties of tomatoes this year, and that's just tomatoes. <laughs> I'm also growing probably 20 different types of flowers, probably 18 different types of peppers. I really enjoy variety because to me the interesting part of gardening is being able to grow things that maybe you can't find at the store or maybe that would be really expensive at the store and maybe the flavor wouldn't be as good. So variety is a big reason to start seeds. There are thousands of varieties of vegetables and flowers and fruits and different things that you can grow if you do it from seed. Whereas when you buy transplants, you're way more limited by what the nursery has. Another reason you wanna start seeds um, is to really get started earlier and have earlier harvests. So just for example, let's say the time that we have our last frost here, I'm located in Central Texas, I'm in zone 8B, our last frost is usually estimated around March 1st. So let's say I wait until after our last frost, I plant a tomato seed. That tomato seed is probably going to take three to four months from a seed to actually get a tomato. So we would be talking tomatoes in late August, early September, and that's a big if on, you know, if they even produced through the summer. Um, tomatoes take a really long time. For reference, I start my tomatoes in January. I usually don't get my first tomato until May or June, so five or six months. So by starting them inside, you're just really advancing that timeline so that you can get tomatoes earlier in the year. Another reason that you may wanna start your own seeds instead of buying transplants is for a large garden space it's actually a lot cheaper so i ran a few numbers don't judge my numbers because this is just for me 
I ran some numbers on how much it would cost to buy all the transplants that I needed for my garden um, this year. I went off of my garden plants for this year. Um, so I ran some numbers on how much it would cost for me to drive, do transplants, how much it would cost for me to just buy all this produce at the store if I didn't have a garden, but I still wanted all of this produce. And then I also ran numbers for how much it cost me to start seeds. So there's a lot of math. Here's all my crazy math. <laughs> um, I actually analyze e-commerce data as my day job, so have that context. Um, so to buy all of these transplants at an average price of $3 per vegetable plant and $12 per flat of flowers, that came to about $276. That's just to buy the transplants and put them in the ground. Um, so $276 to achieve what I would like to achieve this year in my garden by buying transplants. That's not taking into consideration tax. That's not taking into consideration um, really much else other than literally just the price of the plants. Um, the other thing you have to remember when you're buying trans transplants is you have no idea how that plant was grown. You have no idea what kind of soil was used, what kind of fertilizers were used. You're losing a lot of that knowledge, which for some people is totally fine. For me, um, that's not something that I enjoy <laughs> unless I'm like totally in a pinch and I have to buy transplants. So just know that transplants, yes, they're easy. Um, and some people prefer to do it that way for a small garden. If you're super busy, I think it just makes sense, honestly, to buy transplants, uh, but it is gonna be more expensive. And you also have to consider that, you know, for a, a, for a plant like broccoli, for instance, you're gonna buy one broccoli plant and you are going to get one broccoli out of that one plant. So that's something else to think about when you're buying transplants is like, how much am I actually going to get out of this plant? Um, for an example, in part of the numbers that I ran, tomato plants average about eight pounds of production per plant in optimal conditions. So all of a sudden, $3 for a tomato transplant doesn't sound quite as steep considering I'm getting eight pounds of production out of that plant. Whereas, again, going back to the broccoli plant example or a cauliflower, you just get one head. I mean, that's like one meal. You know, we, me and my significant other will eat a whole crown of broccoli in one meal. That's just how we eat. So. That's all stuff to take into consideration when you're buying transplants. Um, so the store value, I took the price, the average price per pound of the produce that I ran for and also note that I plant half of my tomato varieties are heirlooms and heirloom tomatoes at the grocery store are very expensive. They're about $5 a pound. So if we go based on the eight pound per plant average, um, and then we half that and say that half of those are gonna be heirloom tomatoes, and half of those are just gonna be regular old tomatoes that you buy at the store that are like $1.89 per pound, that's over $900 in just the cost of tomatoes at the store versus what I would be growing them. So, the total cost for all of the produce I plan on growing this year, um, and this is based on approximately per pounds of production per plant and average prices from the USDA. This could be more or less. That came to $1,377 to buy all of this produce at the store. So you have $276 for transplants, $1,377 for um, the produce, and this is not taking into consideration uh, organic. This is just like the average USDA price. You would definitely pay, be paying more for organic. I bet the cost would be about more like $1,500 for all of that produce that hopefully I will be producing <laughs> this spring and summer. Um, and finally, the price of seeds. So I calculated this by taking the average price per seed if you buy a packet of seeds for let's say $4 and there's 25 seeds per envelope, which is about your heirloom varieties, you're gonna get way more seeds for like a hybrid variety or like, you know, a, a less specialized variety. But let's just take it at the high end and let's call it 16 cents per seed. 
So I calculated how many plants I would like to grow and how much in seed that's going to cost me. So between seed and then I calculated for starting the seeds, I usually incur a cost of about 40 extra dollars in water over the eight to 10 weeks. Um, it's not that much. And then the electricity, I use all LED and I tried to do like a big long calculation, but I'm not gonna lie, I got confused in the kilowatts per hour and then the hours and then it just all got confusing. I looked at our electricity bills last year from around this time and just note that our house is heated with natural gas, which is far cheaper than electricity. So we incurred about an extra $40 a month in electricity while I was starting my seeds. Um, so I accounted for about 80 extra dollars in electricity and then the soil, I prefer to buy nicer soil um, for, my, for my starts. And so I estimate about $50 in cost of soil. Um, and then the trays, you know, I, I already have my trays, but let's just say you need to buy trays. Um, I, I estimated about $30 in cost for that. So to start seeds, you're looking at about $218 for my sized garden. Now, you're gonna have to think about all these calculations for yourself in your own garden. Um, I do have quite a bit of growing space for being in an urban area. So, just to recap, for me and my gardens and my situation, if I were to not garden at all and buy all of this produce from the store, I would be looking at about thirteen dollars to $1,500 in just produce cost. If I were to buy transplants for everything that I would like to grow, I would be looking at $276, but I would be losing the knowledge of how these things were started and what kind of soil and fertilizer was used, and I would also be decreasing the availability of the variety that I could grow. Or I could start my own seeds, which is what I'll be doing. <laughs> I can start my own seeds, I can have as much variety as I want, and I can have all the control of what kind of soil they're grown in for $218. So that was a very long-winded way of saying, for me and my situation, starting seeds is cheaper and actually fulfills all of the goals that I have in my garden, which are to have a large amount of variety and to know how they were grown. Those are two very important values for me in my garden. So that covers our why. Um, so just to quickly recap, the reason why you should or you may want to start your own seeds at home is that you're gonna get a way larger variety of things that you can grow. Um, you're going, it's going to be a lot cheaper um, for me and my space and my goals in my garden. Um, and you're also going to be able to get ahead on your harvests. So you're going to be able to harvest earlier, um, whereas you wouldn't if you just direct sowed everything in the ground at the given time. So the next question is, when should I start my seeds? Um, this was one that I had a hard time getting my head wrapped around, but now that I've done it for quite a few years, I can pretty much estimate when I need to start my seeds. So the way that you're gonna figure this out is you're going to take your last frost date, okay? You can easily Google this, Farmer's Almanac, it'll pop right up. Our last frost date in zone 8B is technically March 1st. However, based on our weather patterns over the last few years, I do not transplant out my spring garden until about mid-March because I want my nights to be above 45 to 50 degrees for my tomatoes and my peppers. And I just, I don't wanna like mess around with putting covers on stuff. I just wanna put everything out and just like let it live its life. So I usually wait until about mid-March. So I take mid-March that date and um, eight to 10 weeks is generally when you wanna do like tomatoes and peppers. So that takes us back to anywhere from January 1st to July, uh, January 15th. Um, that's the window for me to start my tomato and pepper seedlings with the goal of planting them out Mar like March 15th, let's just call it for easy, easy uh, explanation. So you wanna count eight to 10 weeks out from your last frost date to start things like tomatoes and peppers. There are some things that can only be direct sowed or 
are best direct sowed. Carrots are a good one. Lettuce is best direct sowed. Beans are best direct sowed. So there are definitely a few things um, that are better direct sown. Um, but eight to 10 weeks for tomatoes and peppers. I usually do four to six weeks out from my last frost date for melons, squash, and flowers. There are some flowers that need to be started earlier that have a harder time germinating. I also give my herbs eight to 10 weeks. So here in the next couple of weeks, for me, I will be starting tomatoes, peppers, and herbs. Um, and then about four to six weeks out for my frost date is when I will pretty much do the rest of what I'm going to plant out. So for knowing when, you need to look at three things. When's your last frost date? When do you have time to transplant everything? I would actually dedicate a whole weekend or a whole day to doing this. Mark it on your calendar now so you can plan around it. And then count eight to 10 weeks back for you to start tomatoes and peppers, four to six weeks back from that to start flowers, squash, melons, etc. So next let's talk about everything that you need to start seeds. Um, I already have a pretty established seed starting setup because I've been doing this for a while. Um, but if you are just getting started, there are definitely a few ways you can go about this. A lot of people think that it's super easy to just start seeds on your windowsill, bada bing, bada boom. That's not necessarily how this works. So. If you think about a seed being outside, it's getting intense sunlight for eight to 10 hours a day. So you have to replicate that situation in your home, in your windowsill. There are not a lot of windowsills that get eight to 10 hours a day of, I mean, direct sunlight. And that's why a lot of seed starting fails is because People try and make it like a little too easy and they just put their stuff out on their windowsills or outside on their balconies and sometimes it works. If you get enough sun, it can totally work. Um, a lot of houses don't. My my house does not. So, and I, I have actually never had a place where I've started seeds that gets enough sun. Um, that's why people build glass greenhouses, right? It's a completely glass greenhouse so that the sun as it moves throughout the sky can hit the seedlings at all parts. Um, so that's one way to tackle the light issue. Um, another way, and this is what I actually did for a couple of years, is to use something like this. So this is just a clamp light that you can get at Home Depot. It's got this clamp. I'm pretty sure this is actually for construction sites, so you can just like clamp it anywhere. And then I just bought, I just bought daylight light bulbs. So I literally clamped these to anything, to blinds, um, I, I like clamped them to a pole, like I clamped them to anything and they just plug in and you would just plug them in and unplug them whenever you wanna turn your lights on and then it's got like a little switch. So I used these um, and planted out gardens with them for two years and it worked great. So really, you know, there's no need to like go jump in and invest hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars into getting a seed start, start set up. I literally bought trays, which we'll talk about in a minute. I bought trays, I used these lights, and I actually used old cookie sheets to like water my trays. And that was how I planted out my first spring garden, my first big spring garden. And that was probably one of my most productive gardens. So it can certainly be done. Um, so this I think is a great first step if you're starting just a small number of seedlings or you're just getting started. Um, the lighting situation you can keep pretty easy. I currently have LED shop lights that are hooked onto a wire rack. Um, I'll post a picture of what those look like here. Um, because I just start a lot of seedlings. I start seedlings for myself. I start them for my friends. I start them for my parents. Like I just do a lot of seed starting. And so it just makes sense to have better infrastructure in place. The light though, the most important thing when you're using artificial light and you're starting seeds is you want that light to be like inches away from 
the seed when it's germinating. And this is where a lot of people mess things up. They put the light too far away and then the seed, once it germinates and it comes out of its little casing, it shoots up towards the light and it gets what we call leggy. Some leggy seedlings can be fixed, some cannot. So what you wanna do when you're starting seeds with the light, the biggest thing to remember is to keep the light when the seeds are first germinating really, really close. Um, you wanna watch it though, because once those seeds germinate, you can sunburn your plants and fry them into oblivion. So it's really important to pay attention to the light at first. If you can get through those first couple of weeks when the light needs to be nice and close for your seeds to germinate, you will more than likely be very successful. This is the biggest mistake that people make. I've made this mistake multiple times. I made this mistake uh, over the summer actually when I was starting a lot of my, uh, my garden out, my fall garden with my kales and my collards and all that stuff and I lost so much money and time in seeds and my fall garden, it was actually really upsetting. <laughs> so this is the biggest thing with the light is to keep that light real nice and close to your seedlings when you start them. But we'll get more on the process later. So lights, you can do daylight if you have enough or I would highly recommend, even if you put them in a windowsill, to supplement a little bit of light, even if it's just one of these bulbs. I think this like hood was like less than 10 bucks and the light bulb was like 10 bucks. So for 20 bucks, you can like ensure that you'll have successful seedlings, which I feel like if you've already spent all the money and the time and the energy to do it, like why not, you know? The other, the last thing with lighting is I start my seedlings at 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Um, and then as they grow, I change that to more like what the daylight schedule that they'll actually be getting is. So in the backyard, for example, my backyard garden, they get right around like six to seven hours of light. They're on the lower end for full sun. Um, and for the stuff at my community plot, they get like 12 hours of direct sun. So I like to acclimate my seedlings as we move along to like what their actual daylight schedule will be. But for their initial growth period for probably the first four to six weeks, you're going to want to keep them on 12 hours on, 12 hours off. And the off is very important for vegetables. So after light, arguably the most important part of seed starting is your soil. So with your soil, I have used potting soil, I have used seed starting mix. Seed starting mix, I do feel like is unnecessarily expensive. However, it is really good for starting your seeds because that's what it's for. It's really nice and light, it's nice and fluffy, it's got lots of perlite and so that the roots can get oxygen and so that the roots can easily grow. Um, I have had success using both potting soil and seed starting mix. However, my only issue was that I did have some tomatoes get curly leaf viruses last year and that was when I used potting soil. When I used seed starting mix, I never had them get curly leaf virus. I have no idea if it was in the soil at my community plot or if it was in some contaminated soil. So the advantage of using seed starting mix is you are going, to, it's gonna be sterile. It's, it's totally sterile. Um, but, you're, what I have found is I did have to supplement my seed starting mix with liquid fertilizer um, once the plants got bigger because the seed has enough fertilizer and energy for the plant to germinate and break out of its seed casing. After that, it needs food, it needs nutrients. Because it's seed starting mix is sterile, it's not gonna provide those nutrients. So you will have to provide the nutrients via some liquid fertilizer. I'm not opposed to using liquid fertilizer at the beginning of their life cycle, especially because I use a very high quality um, organic liquid fertilizer. I really like the Happy Frog um, uh, liquid fertilizers. And I don't know that they're certified organic, but they're, I use them. And so I'm okay with that. With the potting mixes, the thing, that, the thing that you can run into with potting mix, you don't have to supplement nutrients usually because they are full of compost and good stuff. 
Um, the only issue I find with potting mix is it can be a little woody. So if there's like little chunks of wood, you have to remember that seed needs to be able to get light to the seed to be able to germinate. So it doesn't necessarily need light to like germinate, but once it does come up out of the soil, it's gonna need light like immediately. So you don't want too many things obstructing that seed from coming up, which like these little wood pieces can definitely do that. So I would say if you're going to use potting soil instead of seed starting mix, I would definitely sift it for any like big stuff. That's probably what I'm gonna do this year. Um, I don't know that I, I'm still on the fence on if I'm gonna use seed starting mix or not. Um, I will say though, getting a good high quality soil is worth it um, for me. But again, that's one of my gardening values is knowing how everything is grown. I want things to be as natural and organic as possible. Um, you probably won't catch me using like a miracle grow. I'll just put that out there. soil we've covered light what about seeds so if you want to do seed starting there's a good chance you already purchased seeds which is awesome things to look out for on seed packets you want to make sure that seed packets have a germination rate and they have a date on them um, you can grow seeds that are like 10 plus years old that's totally possible to do it's pretty difficult um, and you'll get a really low germination rate so you want to make sure that your germination rate which is the rate at which that package or that lot of seeds germinates um you can have germination like 85 percent germination um you will have some seeds that fail that's just kind of how things go with seed starting but making sure that you get good quality seed is very important and for the new gardener i would make sure you get fresh seed from a reputable company um there are plenty of companies out there that are not that reputable um and I mean, but I say that also like my first lot of seeds that I ever grew were like a package from Amazon and they grew just fine and everything tasted fine and I'm still alive to tell the tale. Another thing with seed is to look at whether it's recommended to direct sow or start inside. Most seed packets that are from the larger companies will give you a direction one way or the other. And the last thing about seed is I think there's some people who get confused with the different types of seed that you can buy. So let's talk about that really quick. So there's a few different types of like buzzwords that um, seed packets will have on them. So the first thing to know is, <laughs> I, I come from an actually I'm professionally a marketing and advertising background. So when you see a seed packet that's for a gardener, a home gardener that says non-GMO, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Companies are actually not allowed to sell GMOs to home gardeners. It's not a thing. <laughs> um, so as a home gardener, you never need to worry about getting GMO seeds from a seed company. So you get a seed packet, you don't have to worry about those seeds having genetically modified organism genes. Um, and genetically modified organisms in vegetables are typically to make them disease resistant or insecticide resistant. Um, it's for really big agricultural operations to be able to spray stuff or make them resistant to disease. So no matter how you feel about GMOs, in this context, it doesn't matter. You'll never be able to get GMO seeds as a home gardener from a seed company. Not a thing that's gonna happen. The other two, the other few terms that you'll wanna look out for, um, you're gonna see heirloom. Um, I like to grow heirlooms. That's a, that's a type of seed that I like to grow. And all that that means is that there's a traceable story with that seed. Um, I actually just read, um, I, was, I was sick about a week ago, and when I was sick, I actually had an internet friend um, get me a book. So this book is called Epic Tomatoes, um, and I literally read through it in like, I don't know, four or five days. It was fascinating. And it's got a lot of really great stories about heirloom varieties. These are just stories about how these varieties came to be, but also the other thing about heirlooms is it's a stable variety. So if you grow an heirloom tomato and then you save those seeds, the next year you're gonna get that same tomato, and that's how it works. You might be able to, you might get some rogue ones here and there just because genes mutate, but generally with an heirloom open pollinated variety, that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna continue to get the same variety. It's considered stable. 
the alternative of that is a hybrid. So a hybrid, whether it's like an F1, hybrid F2, whatever, a hybrid tomato is literally going to be like tomato number one, tomato number two, we crossed them with each other, and now here's this new type of tomato that's the hybrid. Those are not stable varieties because that cross is not consistent. It hasn't been consistent. And so if you grow the tomato from your hybrid seed, you could get the same tomato the next year, but it could be different. So a hybrid variety is just not considered stable. Um, and I think it takes like 50 years or something like that for a uh, variety to be considered stable. There's a lot of breeding and the growing that ha that has to go along with making a hybrid into an heirloom. And so that's the thing. Hybrids aren't bad for you. <laughs> All heirloom varieties used to be a hybrid, but now the genetics have been stabilized over time and they're now considered an heirloom. So we've covered hybrid heirloom, GMOs, and the last thing is open pollinated. Now open pollinated, I don't consider this as important to me personally. A lot of the seed varieties that you're gonna see are open pollinated. I'm not too concerned about it. Also the other thing is uh, you'll see organic slapped on uh, seed packs a lot. I think really that just comes down to it being from an organically grown vegetable. I don't know what actually qualifies a seed as being organic. However, I wouldn't, I'm personally not as concerned about if the seed is organic. I'm more concerned about my growing methods for the, for the vegetable or fruit being organic. I want my methods to be organic to get me to the final product. I don't care as much about the seed itself being organic. So. Those are a few terms to understand and look out for when you're actually looking at seed packets. Um, so just to review that one, you wanna get good quality seed that has a germination rate and is fresh seed. If you're more of a seasoned grower, you can probably grow older seeds and be pretty successful. I would not try that as a beginner um, because you're gonna to wanna to just make sure that you're setting yourself up for success. Um, and then we went over all of the terms that you're gonna see on seed packets that you might be like, what does that mean? So next we're going to talk about water and how you water seeds. So with a lot of seeds, a lot of seeds are tiny, they're really small, and so you want to sow them pretty shallow so that they can actually grow. So with that, you have to think about where the water needs to be on that seed, which is really just on the top. So until the seed germinates, I always keep probably like the top inch of the soil really, really moist. And I grab a spray bottle and I just spray things down to make sure like twice a day to make sure things stay really nice and, and moist in there. You can also use a lot of trays will come with the, the like the top thing to keep all the moisture in. I'm a 50-50 on those because I think they sometimes call, cause fungus issues, but people definitely use them. You just want to make sure you remove them pretty promptly after the seeds germinate. So with water, I don't do anything special. I just get the water out of my sink. Some people use distilled water. You can do whatever you feel is best on that whole situation. So after the seeds germinate, you actually want to uh, bottom water, which that is going to look like this. This is a seed starting tray, which we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, and it's also very dirty, it really needs to be cleaned. It's on my to-do list this week. So this is a bottom water tray. And what that means is here's the tray that all of your plants are gonna be in and they have holes on the bottom. And then this tray does not have holes. And that's because these trays fit inside of each other. So you fill this bottom tray with water and then it slowly uptakes the water into the tray so that you can actually water your seedlings without like drowning them. Because especially when they're small, their roots are gonna be really sensitive. So if I water it from the top, it falls over and the foliage of that newly started plant um, gets wet 
and it could cause fungus issues, it could die, it's just not a good idea. So I always keep the top of the soil really moist and then I keep a good amount of water in this tray. So watering, not too complicated, keep it watered, keep it moist, especially I'll be starting my seeds out in my garage, which is pretty dry. So I'll be pretty vigilant about the water situation with my seeds starting this year. Next, let's talk about seed starting trays, which is what this is. So I like these trays. I like this size for vegetables. Um, it's just what I prefer. Um, there is a technique called soil blocking. I haven't really tackled that yet because I have all of this stuff. Um, so once this stuff starts giving out, I might look into soil blocking just because it um, doesn't use plastic. Um, so this is the size tray I like to use for vegetables. Um, and then smaller tray, this smaller tray is actually what I like to use for flowers. So they're kind of, they're just a lot smaller. They're probably like an inch, inch and a half, whereas those other ones are about three inches. Um, and again, bottom watering for flowers as well. The thing about starting your seeds so early and transplanting them is you're going to need to up, up pot them or put them in a larger pot so that they can continue to grow because they will outgrow those small trays. So I do like to get some larger pots to give my stuff plenty of room. I got these this summer because that's when I had the money to invest into them. Um, but actually last year I used uh, straight up red solo cups that I poked holes in the bottom of and they worked great. Um, they didn't fit into the trays as nicely, but they worked just fine. Um, and just a note on that too, you don't need seed starting trays to do this. I think I said this earlier, I literally my first round of seeds, I started um, with clamp lights and a cookie sheet and I used, um, I literally used like yogurt cups and like I cut red solo cups in half and filled them. And so you can really get creative with what containers you use. You just want to make sure the containers that you do use are sterile. So I will actually be these trays. They're very dirty because I didn't have the energy to clean them before, uh, after, after I planted out my fall garden. <laughs> Um, so I will be sanitizing those with a very diluted bleach solution um, here in the next couple of weeks. So in terms of trays, that's what you need. So we have covered, we have two more things to cover for things that you need to start seeds. So don't be overwhelmed yet, it's okay. The next thing is these two things can actually be optional. I choose to go ahead and do them because I feel like they're very important to the success of my seedlings, but again, you could go without them and potentially be fine. The first thing is a heat mat. So this is a heat mat. I bought it on Amazon. It's Vivo Sun. Um, I really like it. And the heat mat provides very gentle heat um, that I find makes peppers germinate really well. Um, I don't find that I need it as much for the other vegetables, but for some reason peppers seem to need a little extra heat. So I have two of these that I'll be using likely under my peppers um, and probably my tomatoes just since they're out in the garage this year and they're not inside. Um, and so the heat mat, um, I actually, the way that I control the heat mat is um, I don't necessarily like having it on all the time. Um, maybe I'll just have it on overnight if it gets cold one night. Um, but I put it on this timer and this timer has two sides. It actually has a side um, that is always on and then it has a side for the actual timer. And so it's nice because I can plug my lights into the timer side and if we're having a cold week or something and I need to keep the heat mats on 24 hours, I can use the always on section. So again, depending on where your plants are, you might not need the heat mat. I would say if your plants are inside your house and you keep your house at least 68 to 70 degrees, you probably don't need the heat mat since all the places that I've started my seeds have been like near windows that are drafty or in the garage. That's why I feel like the heat mat is very necessary to my success. The 
other thing that you might potentially need um, that I would advise very strongly if you're starting your seeds in a room that doesn't get really good airflow or doesn't have like an overhead fan, I would consider getting a fan, like an oscillating just like fan, like a taller fan. And that's because especially with your peppers and your tomatoes and everything really, if they don't ever have the resistance of a little bit of a wind, then they could potentially break when you transplant them out and then they're subjected to the wind. So really in seed starting in general, you're trying to replicate outdoor conditions by using the soil and the light and the water and the airflow and the warmth from the heat mat. You're doing everything you can to replicate ideal conditions outside for these seeds to germinate. So with having a fan on these seedlings, I find that it strengthens the stems a lot which they need and then the other thing is is it prevents fungus which um, when you have a moist environment and not a lot of airflow fungus can take over really fast and multiply really fast and so having that airflow really prevents things from getting all fungusy. So to recap all of that because I know it's a lot <laughs> you are going to need soil good quality soil, either seed starting mix or really good quality potting mix that you've sifted. You're gonna need light, either natural light, if you can get eight hours of good direct natural light, that's great, um, or use the construction lamps or use the LED lights, and you're gonna want those lights on for 12 hours at least to begin with. You're gonna wanna water, make sure things are nice and moist, you're gonna want airflow to prevent fungus, you're gonna wanna get some trays or something that drains, um, like a solo cup with a hole poked out of it. And you're also gonna need good seed and potentially some warmth and some heat. This seems like a lot and it seems like a daunting task. And I'm not gonna lie, I've been collecting things for years, so I probably couldn't tell you the cost of like buying everything to set all of this up. Um, but going back to the why, for me it's very worth it so I can have a wide variety of vegetables and have a lot of control over exactly how these vegetables were grown. A few pro tips from somebody who's done this and both succeeded and failed. Pro tip number one. I heard somebody say this on a podcast one time and I don't really understand how true it is but it gave me like a good visual with the whole leggy seedling situation. So we talked about having that light nice and close to those germinating seedlings. And that's so that they, that they can be short and plump. And this YouTuber that I was watching, she related it to like a baby. I don't have a baby, I've never had a baby. So can't really tell you how true this is. But you want babies to be like fat, I guess, and like not too skinny. I don't understand that part. The short and plump part made sense to me. So if you get that light nice and close, that seedling is going to just grow really thick and lush and it's gonna not grow super fast. If your seedling is growing super fast and the stem is really long, not a good sign. So I like to think of that whole like short and plump thing when I'm thinking about little seedlings. Um, and that really helps me kind of visualize what I should be looking for, um, especially as in somebody who's newly starting seeds. You don't want to see something that's tall and spindly and thin. If it looks weak, it probably is. The next thing is patience. <laughs> um, this is one of those things that I think anybody who's ever started seeds or grown a garden, uh, patience is probably the hardest lesson to learn. I literally check my seedlings. I know that like tomato and pepper seeds take anywhere from like five to 10 days to germinate. It's still very hard for me to be patient enough <laughs> to actually like let that happen. So patience truly is a virtue here. Um, just stick with it, believe in it. I've, I've watered seedlings for like two weeks before. I've been like, okay, I'm giving up. And then all of a sudden, there it goes. It just pops right up. So just be very patient and trust the process. If you're doing all the basics correctly and you have decent high quality seed, you're not gonna have any issues with starting your seeds. The next piece of advice and the next pro tip, um, I think I need to get like this tattooed like on my arm or something, honestly, because it's something that I screw up. I finally didn't screw it up last January when I started my fall, my fall stuff. I did screw it up in the summer, which is kind of funny. Um, one seed per cell. 
I'm telling you last year when I started my spring garden seeds, I literally took a little tiny pair of tweezers and I picked one seed out per cell. Because here's what happens. A couple of years ago, when I first started seeds, I put, I just sprinkled cherry tomato seeds. It was just like, ah, cherry tomatoes. And then I think I had probably about 10 cherry tomato seedlings per cell that I had to separate. I ended up separating them out, growing them, and then I donated them to a local community garden for kids. It's like a, it's like a kids program at different elementary schools where they have gardens and they teach them. I think I donated 80, 80 cherry tomato seedlings because that's how many I grew. I put three in my garden, one, two, three, and I wasted 80 seeds. I didn't waste them, they went to a good cause obviously, but one seed per cell, I promise you that level of diligence will pay off. And if the seed has not germinated, and this happened to a few of my pepper seeds last year, if the seed has not germinated within seven days, stick one more seed, just one, one more seed in that cell. Do not overseed or you will get very frustrated. The next pro tip is to give yourself a lot of grace. Especially when you're first starting out, this is, you're not used to doing this. There's a lot of details that you have to remember and there's a lot of like just things you have to watch for. And ultimately you're probably gonna miss something and you're probably gonna mess something up. So just give yourself a ton of grace. You can always go buy transplants at the store and that's always a backup if something doesn't work out. There's also a ton of resources on the internet, like what you're watching here, for you to be successful. Google it, seriously, Google it. Ask a garden friend, post on Reddit. People want to help you. That's the one thing I've learned about the gardening community is people want to help you. They want you to be successful. So if you reach out to like a local gardening group or email your ag extension office, post on Reddit, um, you know, Google it. There are tons of resources out there to help you if you're having problems with your seed links or if you have a question. Um, shoot, email me send me a picture of your problem seedling and I will help you. Um, Cause I want people to feel really empowered and successful in starting seeds. And the very last thing uh, that I wanna say about starting seeds is you do not have to start seeds to be a good gardener. <laughs> and I just want to make that so abundantly clear. I think when I first started gardening, uh, I always bought transplants and then I got really into gardening and I started wanting to start seeds. And I think it's easy when you start looking up YouTube videos and following gardeners and all of this stuff, it's so easy to get really wrapped up in the whole process. And I'm telling you right now, I'm probably at my community garden, there's 80 gardeners. I am probably one of the only people there that starts their own seeds. Everybody else buys their transplants. I love the process of seed starting because I really love like the whole process. That's why my YouTube channel is called From Seed to Plate because that whole process is just so inspiring to me. It's not that inspiring to some people. <laughs> some people are like, I don't wanna deal with it. I just wanna plant my stuff and be happy and watch it grow. And that does not make you any less of a gardener. Just like starting seeds, does it make you more of a gardener than other people. So if you've watched this whole video and you're like, shoot, that all sounds terrible. I don't want to do any of that. Just know that you don't have to. You really don't. You can buy all your transplants from the store and you are just as much of a gardener as somebody like me who spends 10 weeks of her year every year agonizing over little baby plants, right? Like you are no less of a gardener because you choose to buy transplants over starting seeds. So I just want to spread that message because I think there's definitely just in culture in general today, there's this idea that unless you like, you're not like doing it or it's not real unless you like do the whole rigmarole. And that's just not true. <laughs> it's just, it's just not true. You are, no more let you like you're no more pure of a gardener just because you started all your seeds from from seed right like 
I'm not like sitting here up on my high horse being like, well, I start all of my vegetables from seed and that makes me better than you. That's not it at all. Um, gardening should be something that you thoroughly enjoy. And if you don't enjoy seed starting and if it sounds like a terrible process to you, don't do it. But if you do choose to do it, I find it to be incredibly rewarding and a really fun experience for me. I get just a ton of joy out of starting the seeds and caring for them and watching them go from literally a seed to something that I've made for dinner that I get to eat on my plate. That whole process is incredibly inspiring, which is, again, another reason that I start my seedlings. So thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. I know this video is really long. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments or shoot me an email. If you've liked this video, please subscribe and we will talk all things urban and suburban gardening and um, seed starting season, y'all. Pretty excited. The garden is imminent. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. Happy gardening and we'll see you next time.